A warm and heartfelt welcome on behalf of Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet, Taj Bengal Kolkata and Harper Collins to the much anticipated launch of Amitav Ghosh's latest literary masterpiece, Smoke and Ashes, a writer's journey through opium's hidden treasures. We hope that this evening will be filled with inspiration, thought-provoking discussions and a shared passion for literature that brings us together as a community of avid readers and thinkers. Thank you all for gracing us with your presence this evening. And without much further ado, let me now welcome our guests on the dais for the official launch of the book. With a warm round of applause, please welcome Mr. Amitav Ghosh. <laughs> Shupriyadi, if I could invite you on stage as well. Uh, Mr. Udayan Mitra from Harp Collins and Mr. Mohan Chandran from Taj Bengal and Ms. Malvika Banerjee from the Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet for the official launch of the book. I would now like to invite Mr. Mohan Chandran, Senior Vice President Operations, East and North and the Man Nepal and Bhutan of Taj Bengal to address the gathering. Thank you. Having spent over three decades with the Taj, I must say this is one of the most pleasurable aspects of the job to be able to do such wonderful introductions, especially for an avid reader like myself. It's a great privilege to welcome and introduce Amitav Ghosh uh, at the book launch of Smoke and Ashes. Most of you, all of you in the room know him, have read his works, uh, particularly his historical fiction, so well researched, a man with a, with a wonderful narrative style. But I also think in recent years, it's his non-fiction writings that have made a significant impact on me, particularly his recent uh, works on environmental degradation, Amitav, I think, count for a lot in today's world. In this particular book, I'm about halfway into reading this one, there is also the added patina of his family's ancestral history with this opium trade, which makes for an even more uh, wonderful layer in that book. And uh, I think the examination of the suppression of a memory of the part that opium has played in the history of this country, in the history of the growth of colonialism, Amitav also makes this very wonderful argument about the divergent paths that this industry took in the east and the west of the country, and the lasting socioeconomic impact that has had, the effects of which can even be felt today in certain parts of the country. So I think it's going to be a great conversation and a great book to read. I would encourage everyone to pick up a copy. And on this note, I will hand over to Udayan to carry forward the proceedings for the evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Udayan Mitra. I am executive publisher at HarperCollins India. We are very proud and privileged to publish Amitav Ghosh's new book, Smoke and Ashes. And, um, I, I won't really introduce Amitav because all of you know him. Uh, I think suffice it to say that he is one of the world's most renowned and leading writers and also uh, one of the most beloved writers. And through the fiction spanning right, right from the circle of reason and the shadow lines, right, right through to uh, the Hungry Tide, Glass Palace, and the Ibis Trilogy, on to Gun Island, and alongside um, the nonfiction that he's recently published, he, he uh, published two books, two small books with us, Jungle Nama and The Living Mountain, which you'll see here. Um, and the new book uh, is, of course, uh, nonfiction as well. Uh, it's a remarkable trajectory, as you all know, a remarkable trajectory of writing and publishing. And we, we are, I think, as readers, uh, uh, Many of us in this room, most of us in this room, would have been fans of Amitav's uh, 
Ever since we started reading English literature, he defined English literature for us uh, in many ways. And um, it, it is, it's really, um, as I said, it's a privilege to, to publish him. Um, I should also mention that uh, Amitav was the winner in 2019 of the, not winner, I should say the Ganpit Award was conferred on him in 2019 and he was the very first uh, English language author to be conferred this very high honor. Um, delighted that uh, Shupriya Chaudhuri will, will be in conversation with Amitav today, later. Uh, cannot think of a better person to be in conversation with him. Really looking forward to that conversation. And uh, I will just take two minutes of your time to very quickly from the publisher's side to introduce the book. Um, Smoke and Ashes, the story of Smoke and Ashes, the story of writing Smoke and Ashes goes back more than 20 years. This is when Amitabh was researching for the three novels that would later become the Ibis Trilogy, uh, Sea of Poppies, River of Smoke, and Flood of Fire. And in, as he was researching, it, it, was, it was a journey of discovery. And he recounts that fascinating journey in Smoke and Ashes into economic, social, cultural history. And he also tells us uh, you know, how, how the discoveries that he made along the way um, influenced him, both, both as a writer and as an individual. In the book, he peels layer after layer of perceptions and understandings of Indian and Chinese history. The, the story of Smoke and Ashes starts with China and then goes through the way of tea onto opium and then to the opium trade and then onwards. So these perceptions and understandings of Indian and Chinese history, which have contemporary relevance as well, trade patterns, cultural imperatives, all of these as he, as he shapes the narrative for us, our view of the past that has shaped the world that we inhabit today, expands progressively and, and we gain a deeper, sharper focus. So smoke and ashes, how would I describe it? it? It's not just an excursion into history. It's not just a memoir. It's not just a travelogue. Uh, it's not just a deep dive into the repercussions of colonialism and the opium trade, th that all of these things impact us still. It is all of these things, but it's more. It's um, quite simply one of the most powerful and arresting books of our time. We at HarperCollins India are very proud to be the first publisher in the world to bring this book to readers. The book will be published in the UK and the US, but several months from now. Readers in India are the very first readers in the world to be able to encounter this remarkable book. And we at HarperCollins are truly privileged to be able to bring this to readers. Uh, Amitav has been on um, a multi-city tour in India. Calcutta is the last leg of that tour, tour, Kolkata, I should say, is the last leg of that tour. And um, it is, of course, a homecoming of sorts. And I'm so glad that we close with this brilliant audience, uh, 400 plus people in, in this room, um, who are going to hear Amitav Ghosh uh, speak on Smoke and Ashes, first on his own and then in conversation with uh, Shupriyati. Thank you so much. I know you have all been waiting to hear from him, so now let me invite on stage Mr. Amitav Ghosh to take you through the journey of this book. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. It's just wonderful to be uh, in this room again and to be uh, in front of so many old friends, new friends, <laughs> everything. So thank you all for coming and uh, for being here. I'd like to thank <coughs> Mr. Mohan Chandran uh, 
of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, who, you know, who's been looking after this hotel for a long time and who's an old, uh, become an old friend, uh, Mr. Adnab Chatterjee and Mr. Saurabh Mitra, also of the Taj, uh, for all their hospitality here. Um, and then, uh, it's wonderful to have this book out from uh, HarperCollins. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience working with HarperCollins. Uh, I wanted the book to come out first uh, in India from HarperCollins, uh, not just for uh, nationalistic reasons, but uh, because HarperCollins, uh, really, they've been doing such an incredible job on my last couple of books. It's been such a pleasure to work with them, with their production teams. And also, because I have my wonderful editor, Uden Mitra, who was just here a few minutes, uh, who just spoke in, uh, before me, uh, he's, a, he's one of the great editors uh, in, uh, in the country. And also, HarperCollins has uh, an amazing copy editor. Her name is Shoturupa Ghoshal. Uh, she, you know, she's one of the last practitioners of a craft that is increasingly threatened uh, in, uh, in the West now. There are very few people who actually do copy editing in the old sense. They usually hire... Uh, you know, uh, people who are freelancing or something, and they can't really give you the kind of attention, you know, that a book like this needs. So, uh, Shatarupa is incredibly meticulous. She, miss, she sometimes misses a couple of things, which we all do, <laughs> but uh, she's, um, she's just uh, incredibly meticulous, and it's uh, just always such a pleasure to work with her. <coughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Malvika Banerjee and Pratiti Ganatra of the Kolkata Lit Meet uh, for uh, helping to host this wonderful occasion. And my great thanks also uh, to Shukant Choudhury, who's, uh, who's you know, been a friend and uh, you know, fellow traveler, I might say, <laughs> along this long, long time, who helped me with uh, certain critical parts of this book, some of which uh, I'll touch upon today. And also, uh, Shupriya Choudhury, who's been an old, old friend from whom I've learned so much, and I'm so grateful to you, Shupriya, for agreeing to do this uh, with me today. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to have you, uh, to have you here. So I'm, I'm going to talk about this book uh, uh, a little bit. And the book begins uh, with the story of tea, because tea has been absolutely fundamental to the relationship uh, between India and China. I mean, we may think today uh, that tea is chai and it's all, you know, it's Indian, but the very word uh, comes from a Chinese term. And of course, so does, uh, so does the plant itself. So here you can see this is a, a tea from the Bohia country. And uh, this, is, this is an interesting uh, picture because it shows you how tea was uh, grown in China and still is grown, which is as a, uh, as a sort of small crop that's adjunct to other, uh, to other crops. It was never a sort of plantation crop. It couldn't be because the whole model of plantations uh, was invented by uh, colonialists uh, beginning with the Car uh, Caribbean. And then that model was imported into India. Uh, this is a picture, uh, this picture shows you the entire sort of uh, uh, process of, the, of tea production and this is a, a British view of something similar. And this is uh, Western merchants negotiating the price of tea uh, in China. Now what's interesting is that the, uh, the British tea trade was the exclusive monopoly of the East India Company, uh, which had to pay for all its purchases of uh, Chinese tea uh, with silver, a silver bullion. Uh, this was a real problem for them be, uh, because, uh, you know, it meant that there was a great imbalance uh, in trade, but also it, because tea became completely essential uh, to the British economy uh, in the early modern period. Through much of the 18th and 19th centuries, the tax on tea accounted for nearly a tenth of Britain's revenues. It earned the British government as much as all land, property, and income taxes put together. It could pay for the salaries of all government servants, for all public works and buildings, for all expenses related to law, justice, education, art, and science, and for Her Majesty's colonial, consular, and foreign establishments combined. <laughs> 
So you can see what an enormous, uh, what an enormous part of the British economy was dependent on tea, and the British actually charged uh, between 100 to 200 percent taxes on tea, uh, whereas the Chinese charged an export tax of only 10 percent. So the British uh, were actually making much more money out of the tea trade than the Chinese were. Uh, the problem for the British is that they had to pay for tea with bullion. And at a, at a certain point, because this was also when the Europeans were colonizing uh, the Americas, uh, they could, uh, you know, uh, they could uh, just get enormous quantities of silver uh, from the mines of South America. So this is the, the, Potosi, the famous Potosi silver mine. Uh, this is Potosi again. Uh, so these mines uh, that Western colonialists uh, worked with, uh, with the labor of enslaved Africans, but most of all with the labor of uh, enslaved uh, uh, um, uh, in indigenous Americans, they were incredibly exploitative. I mean, uh, the, the suffering that the mine workers went through in these places, especially the indig indigenous peoples, I mean, it's actually just beyond uh, contemplation, you know. But their, their labor helped uh, our colonialists, uh, you know, in the sense of providing them with massive amounts of silver, which they were able to use for, uh, to buy Chinese tea. But from the early 18th century onwards, uh, silver uh, became relatively scarce within the, within the world economy. So uh, uh, you had this kind of balance of payments problem. Chinese were exporting enormous quantities of tea, but also silk, porcelain, etc., many other kinds of manufacturing goods to England, whereas English exports to China were, uh, were tiny. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's interesting to look at this balance of payment problem uh, within a sort of modern context, because, uh, you know, as you can see, the U.S. trade deficit with China is still enormous, and that's true also of India. So, <clears throat> You know, China has always been the sort of world's workshop, producing enormous quantities of, uh, of goods which the world wanted. But the Chinese didn't really have much use for anything that, uh, uh, that anyone else in the world wanted. So the China, China's Qianlong Emperor, uh, in a letter sent to King George III in 1793, says, we have never valued ingenious articles, nor do we have the slightest need of your country's manufacturers. And uh, the American history, uh, historian Keith McMahon has made the suggestion that Chinese self-sufficiency was a source of intense anxiety uh, to the British and indeed to Europeans generally because they discerned in it the possibility of a rival master race. And it's very interesting, I mean, uh, the same sort of narrative played out also in the Dutch East Indies. So, the British are faced with this problem in the mid-18th century. How do you pay for Chinese tea? Because they don't have any silver uh, left. So they had this bright idea. Uh, because uh, the, in, whereas the Chinese didn't want anything really from Britain, there were a few things that they wanted from India. Cotton was one of them. And the other was medicinal opium. Uh, they took all sorts of medicinal substances from India. But one of these was uh, opium. Now, the thing about opium is that opium is an absolutely miraculous substance. It's the oldest and most powerful medicinal substance known to man. And this remains substantially true to, uh, to this day. So even in the 19th century, you can see how many kinds of, uh, you know, uh, opioid-based medications uh, 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 the, uh, the, the British used, for example, and even here, you know, we were, many of us were given Woodward's gripe water, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, which is basically opium. It's a solution of opium. I remember I, I, I was given that, and uh, I'm sure uh, many others here were as well. So, uh, you know, opium was so essential as a medicinal substance that, in fact, a character in my novel, Sea of Poppies, says, you would do well to bear in mind that it would be well nigh impossible to practice modern medicine or surgery without such chemicals as morphine, codeine, and narcotine. And these are but a few of the blessings derived from opium. In the absence of gripe water, our children would not sleep. And what would our ladies, why, our beloved queen herself, do without laudanum? Because, you know, Queen Victoria loved her laudanum. 
Why one might even say that it is opium that has made this age of progress and industry possible. Without it, the streets of London would be thronged with coughing, sleepless, incontinent multitudes. Uh, so, uh, you know, opium to this day it plays an enormously important part uh, in, uh, in medicine. And uh, so this is contemporary opium being grown somewhere. Would anyone like to hazard a guess about where this is? Uh, nope. Nope. Where? N nope. Uh, it's actually Tasmania. Tasmania is now responsible for a huge uh, amount of opium production. And uh, they, they grow a genetically modified kind of uh, uh, opium. Uh, it's the extra high-grade opium that is used to produce Oxycontin and, you know, those, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, opioid painkillers. And, uh, you know, uh, we should dread the day when this kind of genetically modified opium starts being cultivated uh, in other parts, including uh, uh, in, in India and around India. Because, uh, you know, then we're going to have another extremely serious problem. But so, uh, in fact, opium has always been a vitally important substance. Uh, going back, uh, you know, to antiquity, human beings essentially co-evolved with opium. Uh, the opium poppy doesn't actually exist in the wild. It's a cultivar that uh, humans develop. So, uh, you know, op uh, op there, there has existed an opium trade for a very, very long time, going back to antiquity. And it existed here as well. Uh, this trade, however, expanded in two or three leaps. So one happened uh, after the Mongol invasions because the Mongol, the Mongol courts uh, uh, used opium. And through them, the successor states to the Mongol courts, that is uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, the Mughal Empire, the, they ha in their courtly cultures, opium had quite an important place. I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the kings, princes, etc., would uh, use opium in their, uh, you know, recreationally. So the Mughal emperor Jahangir's uh, wine cup and opium bowl, uh, and they all had many of these. So the opium, pr the opium that they consumed, uh, the Mughals, for example, came basically from this region. That is, uh, this is the old Bengal presidency from Patna, uh, past Benares, uh, basically along the Ganga. So this was the main opium producing region. And this region falls into the hands uh, of the East India Company after the Battle of Buxar in the, uh, in the 1760s. As soon as it falls into the hands of the, uh, of the British, they declare a complete monopoly over the opium trade shutting out all local traders, etc. It became a crime for anyone to trade in opium other than with the British. So the British established uh, this complete monopoly over this, uh, over this, uh, over this produce. And in the, uh, in the 1770s, uh, they decided to create two major opium factories to process the opium. One of these was in a place called Ghazipur, a very beautiful place, as you can see, it had this uh, uh, it had this uh, copy of the Chehel Satoon of Isfahan. Uh, there were other palaces, etc. And Ghazipur also happens to be where uh, Lord Cornwallis, who was Governor General of India, he's a very infamous man, uh, known for his terrible role in the American War of Independence, where he came to be known as Butcher Cornwallis. So, of course, he was rewarded with a Governor Generalship. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> this is the tomb of Lord Cornwallis. And this is a plan of the uh, Sadar Opium Factory in Ghazipur, as it was known. And uh, the extraordinary thing about the, uh, the Opium Factory of Ghazipur is that it still exists. And it continues to be one of the largest producers of opium in the world. And uh, 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 it's an extraordinary thing that this factory is the single oldest and most lucrative uh, industrial enterprise in India. From the 1770s onwards, it's been producing enormous wealth. Enormous wealth first for the British Empire, now produces uh, uh, for the Indian Republic. But uh, the, ex the really astonishing thing is that the conditions under which the opium is produced there as you can see, uh, the local people, the workers who produce this opium, uh, 
uh, are just uh, ordinary, uh, uh, far, uh, you know, uh, farmers from around, uh, from around uh, this part of eastern UP. And here again, you can see that, uh, you know, they're just, uh, they're just uh, completely ordinary people. And they, they get very few benefits. Uh, they've, they've never really earned very much from, uh, from opium. In fact, uh, uh, it's actually been quite the opposite. They've, uh, the burden of producing opium in these factories has been very, been very difficult for them in, in many ways. The curious thing about the Ghazipur opium factory is that in the 19th century, uh, this became a great uh, stop on the British grand tour of India. There were sort of tourist, uh, you know, guidebooks written to it. So we have endless descriptions of it from a lot of British travelers, including Kipling, if you like, but almost none from any Indian source. One person who visited the Ghazipur opium factory was Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Tagore had a relative who actually worked in the Ghazipur opium factory. But, you know, Tagore's other connections with the, uh, you know, his, his grandfather, Darukanath Thakur, was a, uh, was a very major trader in opium. Uh, so Tagore obviously had very, very conflicted feelings about uh, the opium industry. And he repeatedly denounced the opium industry throughout his, uh, his career. In fact, I think it was, in a sense, his, uh, his attitudes of uh, uh, guilt in relation to uh, opium that made him uh, develop his longstanding relationship also with China. But uh, during his stay, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tagore was visited by several uh, relatives, including his sister, Shonnu Kumari uh, Devi, who wrote a long piece, actually, about it, which uh, Shukantada uh, made available to me. So uh, it's a very, it's, uh, I talk about it in the book. But he, he went to many other factories and many other tourist spots in Ghazipur, but he never set foot in the opium factory, which tells us something, you know. So the other major factory was in Patna. And here is a plan of the Patna, uh, of the uh, Patla opium factory. And here's a, uh, here's a painting of the Patna opium factory by Sitaram, an artist called Sitaram. Uh, I think Sitaram was perhaps uh, the greatest 19th century painter in India. Uh, unfortunately, his work is completely unknown to us. But Sitaram belonged to this very interesting school of painters uh, they were uh, they were Kayasts uh, from Rajasthan, from the region around uh, around Rajasthan, and in the 16th century they moved to Agra, Delhi, etc., and they joined the ateliers of the Mughal emperors, basically producing paintings in the Mughal style. But when the Mughal Empire began to disintegrate, uh, they moved further eastwards, and they founded the school of Murshidabad. And uh, Sitaram was probably from the Murshidabad school because uh, he, his great patron uh, was Lord Moira, uh, later Lord Hastings. And Lord Hastings in 1815-16 went on this grand yatra, uh, you know, from, uh, from, Delhi, uh, from, from Kolkata all the way to, uh, to Delhi. He took 10,000 people with him, you know, <laughs> soldiers, etc. So you can imagine it was probably like a swarm of locusts moving up the country. But uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Sitaram made all these in really interesting uh, paintings. Now, what's very interesting about this one is that uh, you'll see, if you look right at the bottom, do you see that ledge there and, and the figure right near the bottom border? That's Sitaram painting himself, painting the picture. You know, it's such an interesting conceit. I mean, it reminds you, it makes you think of Velasquez, you know, in, in, the, in Las Niñas. And, uh, uh, you know, so he takes on, his conceit here is that he is actually a bird, you know, seeing the curvature of the earth. Uh, that's what makes this painting so interesting. I, I think he was, uh, uh, he, he, he was playing with all kinds of interesting ideas. And this is another picture by uh, Sitaram of the opium go down in Patna. As you'll see here, you know, the interesting thing that he's doing in relation to this uh, opium factory is that uh, there are no people in it, even though we know that it was, uh, you know, uh, the, it had a workforce of tens of thousands of laborers. But he's producing these pictures to be basically shown uh, in England. So he wants to present a beautiful image of the, of, uh, of the factory. And the way that he does this is by representing it basically like a Mughal palace, you know. Uh, so here again, no people. Uh, it looks very clean, it looks, uh, it looks very orderly. Uh, 
And along with the opium factories, the British administered this entire region through something called the Opium Department. This massive like kingdom within an empire. Uh, you know, they, they basically ruled the whole of Purvanchal under what we would today call emergency powers. That is, the Opium Department had uh, penal powers of many kinds. And uh, so uh, they had this system of opium agents spread across Purvanchal. This is the Patna uh, Opium Bungalow, an encampment. Uh, this is the French factory, which also existed in Patna. Now, along with the pictures of Sitaram, we actually, it's an interesting thing to contrast them uh, with a set of paintings that was made uh, uh, much later, uh, about 40 years later, by an English surveyor who was producing these, uh, these etchings uh, for an exhibition in London. So, look how different uh, these, uh, these pictures are. So, he's presenting you a view. Again, he's obviously in love with perspective and so on. But he's presenting you a view of the opium factory where it's almost like the temple of Karnak. You know, I mean, it's so grand with these massive proportions, uh, these enormous pillars, uh, uh, you know, I mean, with these very, very high ceilings. Uh, it's a very impressive looking thing. And basically what he's doing is that he's trying to present you an image, or rather he's trying to present uh, the British uh, uh, visitor to the exhibitions, uh, of, uh, you know, the idea that the British Empire is bringing this kind of industry to India, creating all these uh, fabulous uh, uh, buildings and structures. Uh, <clears throat> but almost contemporary to him is an, uh, an Indian artist of the Patna Kalam school, also, uh, you know, uh, Rajasthani Kayas uh, uh, origin, and his name is Shivalal, and this is his view of what was going on in the Patna uh, opium factory. And as you can see, it's completely different. You know, the, uh, the built environment basically doesn't exist. You see very recognizable figures, you know, in dhotis, basically carrying stuff around and, uh, uh, you know, doing this work in essentially, you know, what we would recognize today as a karkhana, you know, some sort of workshop or kar uh, a karkhana where they're making this, uh, this opium and, uh, you know, basically all the work there is done by hand. This was something that really shocked Kipling. Uh, he asked, aren't there any machines that can do this work? And he was told, no, there, there aren't. So here we have Shivalal's, uh, Shivalal's vision of the, uh, a completely contrasting vision. You know, one of the colonizer, one of the colonized. Uh, there's also this uh, final picture of the uh, Patna Opium Godown. By, by Sitaram, which again I think is just so interesting because uh, as you can see here, he's really playing with volumes and, uh, and shapes. And I think what he's doing quite self-consciously is putting this picture uh, in conversation uh, with the work of uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi, who was a very famous 18th century painter, uh, Italian, who was doing uh, uh, this kind of work. So it's interesting to think that, you know, uh, even then at the early, in the early 19th century, they're very much addressing certain kinds of uh, European work. So from Patna and Ghazipur, the opium, uh, the opium is transferred to these fleets. Later it would become the railways, uh, and it would come down, uh, down river from Bhagalpur. It would pass Murshidabad. It would come to Serampur, Barakpur, then Fort William, Calcutta. This is government house. And then the opium would be auctioned uh, in Kolkata, actually, in what is now, in one corner of what is now BBD Bag. And uh, this is, it was the most important, uh, it was the most important place in Calcutta virtually, uh, as certainly as important as writer's building. And the place where it was, and later actually the building itself, was, I think, this one, which is now where the HSBCs uh, uh, main office in Calcutta. And that's a very interesting thing because, of course, the HSBC was founded on the opium trade itself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just a fact. So, so what happens is that from the Bengal province alone, from the Bengal presidency alone, from 1771 to 1840, a 70-year period, you see this enormous growth uh, in opium exports. But 
And, uh, you know, uh, most of which is meant uh, for Southeast Asia, but really the bulk of it is uh, meant for China. But at the same time, uh, independent merchants in, uh, princely, in various princely states in central India uh, started also encouraging uh, opium cultivation. So this region, Malwa, also begins, uh, gets into a kind of race with, uh, with Bengal for producing opium. And this is what we have. Uh, this enormous, phenomenal growth of uh, opium production in India over this uh, period, over basically just a 40-year period, you can see. So from 1795, even then, it's mainly just medicinal opium being sent to China. But by the 1840s, China is facing essentially a tsunami of opium coming towards it uh, from India. And this opium is being abused on an enormous scale. They're, 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 they're facing a mass addiction problem. So that's why in uh, 1839, the emperor of China tries to shut down the opium trade uh, and uh, he confiscates all the opium that British and Indian traders are bringing in there. And that leads to the first opium war. So I'm going to stop there. I could go on forever, but uh, I'd, I'd much rather talk to Shupriya. So. Thank you. I would now like to call Shupriya Di on stage, please, to take the conversation forward. We will have some audience questions at the end of the conversation, and then we will request Mr. Ghosh to sign uh, your copies of the book. Amitabh, thank you so much for that absolutely riveting presentation. Um, I had some questions, but many of them have been driven out of my head by, uh, you know, the images that you sh showed and what you said about the beginnings of the opium trade. But I wanted to ask you, actually, about the writing of the book. And uh, I know this was a very difficult book for you to write. Uh, you write at the end of the book that um, you started writing it. Then at a certain point, you gave up, you set your material aside, you returned your advances to the publishers, which is a major step to take. And then only many years later, after perhaps you had written the Ibis Trilogy, you came back uh, to the book. And part of the reason for this, you say, quoting Tagore, was because of the incredibly depressing nature of the story that is being told here. Uh, you speak of uh, what Tagore calls the despicable meanness of human nature that is revealed in and through the opium trade. Uh, do you think that your coming back to this subject now has something to do with our present sense of planetary uh, concerns, planetary um, disasters and what we have done to ourselves over uh, a long period? Uh, that's a very good question and it's absolutely uh, gets to the heart of it. Yes, uh, after I finished writing the Ibis trilogy in around about 2012, uh, 2014, uh, I, um, I thought I would write this book. I, you know, my agent, uh, you know, proposed it to publishers and they were enthusiastic and I signed contracts and then I started working on the book because I had an enormous amount of material already then. But it was a very deeply depressing um, uh, subject, you know. I mean, it's very hard to see. At that point, I found it very hard to see anything redeeming, you know, about, uh, uh, about this story. But then, it's exactly as you say, I came back to it uh, in more recent times because I do feel that this is a story that really needs to be told. It needs to be told in the first instance because, uh, you know, because it punctures so many of the myths uh, that circulate about capitalism as such. But more than that, you know, we live at a time where we are encouraged to think of human beings as omnipotent, as, uh, you know, homo deus, as, if, you know, humans as God, as if all-powerful. And this, uh, this story tells us, like the story of climate change, it tells us a story that is completely different. 
It's a story about human frailty. It's about the fragility of human societies. And that's why I think it's a story that really needs to be, uh, that needs to be better known. Um, may I just stay with that for a point uh, for a moment longer and say that in a way uh, you uh, mentioned to us that uh, Tagore uh, spent some time, six months or so in Ghazipur, uh, though he didn't visit the opium factory and that you and Tagore have one thing in common in a sense, opium, uh, because your forefathers also settled down in a small place called Chapra, which attained prosperity because of the opium trade. And although your forefathers were not involved in that, in a sense, the reason why they settled in Chapra may have been because of the relative prosperity and the possibility for litigation, as it were, in the place because of the opium trade. So, in a sense, while Tagore was turned against the opium trade by his own sense of a kind of family guilt, because his grandfather, Darukanath Thakur, uh, whom he mentions very little, practically never at all in his writings, uh, who uh, had made his fortune from the opium trade. Uh, in a sense, your interest in the opium trade is also a kind of um, something that you've uh, got from your family. Um, I can't say that I got it from my family. It, uh, you know, well, the story goes that my father's family uh, went, uh, uh, went from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, the story goes that round about 18, uh, in the mid-1850s, uh, uh, my family, which was actually from Bikrampur, uh, uh, you know, near Dhaka, now in Bangladesh, uh, there was a massive flood which drowned my ancestral village. And the family started moving westwards. And they moved and moved until finally they settled of all places in Chapra, uh, you know. And when I uh, used to hear this story, uh, it always puzzled me because, you know, when I was coming of age in the 70s and so on, uh, Bihar uh, and Chapra and so on were always often presented in a kind of negative light, you know, the associations being poverty and so on, backwardness and so on. So I thought, why of all places did they, would they settle in Chapra? And uh, I thought initially maybe they had some connection with uh, the indenture because Chapra became also one of the centers for, uh, you know, the, uh, the then rapidly increasing industry of indenture. So, what, uh, so what I, when I started writing Sea of Poppies, it was basically with that idea in mind. But I rapidly came to understand that, in fact, what Chapra was really the capital of uh, was the opium trade, in a sense, uh, because uh, it was the uh, district headquarters of Saran District. And Saran District was one of the biggest producers of opium uh, in the country, you know. So, you know, it's just a question of putting two and two together. I mean, I, you know, uh, the British Opium Department employed very large numbers of Bengalis, which is how uh, Robi Thakur's uh, relative ended up there. In fact, there were complaints that, you know, the work of the Opium Department is conducted in Bangla. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I can, I can assure you that in this audience, uh, there will be hardly anyone uh, whose uh, family uh, has not been at some stage associated with the opium trade. Because essentially, it was the major economic moving force in eastern India. Uh, yes, well, let's, uh, you know, just ask a little more about the trade. Uh, I've been rereading Jairus Banaji's uh, Brief History of Commercial Capitalism. And indeed, the opium trade is a great Uh, it's a great model of commercial capitalism. And in fact, it shows two kinds of capitalism at work, which you contrast uh, through the two cities, Calcutta and Bombay. Uh, you show how um, the British East India Company uh, goes for a kind of plantation economy, 
So they are extractive, uh, you know, producers of opium, planting opium over a, lo a large area and uh, really impoverishing the local peasantry in order to grow this opium and to make great profits uh, uh, to the detriment of the local uh, agricultural economy. Whereas the Bombay merchants, who also, of course, uh, do a very roaring business in opium, are not actually cultivating the opium themselves. They are putting out, as it were, they are buying the opium from independent uh, growers and producers. And in the end, they are actually more successful in the market and in uh, exporting opium to uh, China uh, to some extent than the British uh, companies. So uh, Banaji actually talks about uh, Jardine Matheson who are exporting 40,000 chests of opium at one point in the 1830s, 1840s, and Matheson is really responsible, Jardine actually, William Jardine, is really responsible for the first opium war. But then by the, you know, by 1858, when uh, opium is legalized in China, for forcibly legalized, by that time the Sassoons, Baghdadi Jews in Bombay, have taken over more or less the opium trade and made much greater profits from it. Would you like to say a little bit about that? Uh, yes, so what actually happens is that the model uh, the economic models uh, that, that emerge in the late 18th century uh, in Eastern and Western India become completely different. And it's basically all traceable to the fact that the Maratha states were able to resist the British much more effectively uh, than the states that existed in the Gangetic Plain. So they fought the British to a standstill in the late 18th century. They fought them, uh, they, you know, they competed very vigorously with them. It wasn't until 1803 that the British really, great, after the Battle of Asaye, that the British really gained ascendancy over them. But even after that, the Sindhya state possessed a very powerful army, you know. So the British couldn't just tell them what to do. So the Sindhyas and the Holkars and so on, uh, because the, they were powerful enough and because the British didn't have direct rule over there, they had, uh, you know, indirect rule, uh, they were able to protect their merchants and merchant networks who in turn were able to encourage small-scale cultivators. So basically what happened in Western India, which is something I describe at great length in my book, uh, is that the profits from the opium trade percolated downwards and mainly stayed in indigenous hands, you know, so that it enriched, uh, it enriched m many of the commercial uh, families, the commercial networks of Western India, and uh, it also, to some degree, uh, enriched the farmers and so on. And most of all, it, ga it made Bombay as a city completely different from Calcutta in the sense that Bombay became really a home of uh, a laissez-faire trade where Westerners had to compete with Indians because Indian merchants actually had access to the product. You know, because those products you couldn't just go and try, buy on the market. The East India Company tried to drive uh, uh, native traders out of the market, but they found they just couldn't muster the resources. Uh, you know, so they, uh, they actually, as it were, mobilized the market as well as armed force uh, against uh, the East India Company. And this has left, I think, uh, a permanent mark upon India. Uh, you know, the, the commercial communities of, uh, of Kolkata uh, were basically all, uh, all um, uh, uh, Scottish. Basically Scottish, you know, and the only communities that could resist them were the uh, uh, Western uh, merchant communities who had access, uh, you know, to the Malwa trading networks. So this was why in the 18th century, in the 19th century, uh, Calcutta began to attract many merchants uh, from Western India uh, because, uh, you know, for them it was important to have a presence in Calcutta because of the uh, Calcutta opium auctions. But basically, uh, indigenous traders, that is to say Bengali and uh, Bihari merchants, were uh, completely driven out 
uh, because they couldn't compete. Because, you know, even someone like, uh, someone like Darukanath Thakur, if he, if he put in a bid, or the Malliks or whatever, uh, if they put in a bid on, uh, in the Calcutta opium auctions, unlike, say, a British bidder, they had to pay up in full, instantly. Whereas the British were allowed, uh, where, uh, you know, well, let's call a spade a spade, basically white merchants uh, were given a certain grace period. This was not allowed to indigenous merchants. They were also not provided insurance by the East India Company. So through these mechanisms, they managed to shut indigenous traders out of, uh, out of the Kolkata economy as such. And I think this has really left a lasting mark, you know, uh, on the commercial culture of Eastern India. Thank you for that, because uh, actually, you know, one very interesting strand running through your book is this story of merchant communities. And, of course, it is a very important uh, subject of the IBIS trilogy as well. Uh, Calcutta, in fact, had very thriving merchant communities in the early, uh, let's say, 17th and 18th centuries, the Armenians, the Baghdadi Jews, uh, and later the Marwaris, whom you just mentioned. Uh, but um, uh, they don't thrive in the same way as they did in Bombay. And I remember in the River of Smoke, for example, you have this character called Bahram Modi, who is a ben uh, whose beneficiary is an Armenian merchant, Zadig, I forget the second name. Aramedia. Yes. And uh, they, they, you know, very, very interesting uh, um, bond that forms between them and they help each other. And this Bahram Modi is a young man from uh, the small western town in Gujarat of Navsari. Now, Navsari I know very well because uh, my uh, grandfather, my maternal grandfather, a Maharashtrian scholar, having taught at the University of Dhaka, after partition, uh, had to leave East Bengal and settled in the town of Navsari. And I recognized immediately the kind of house that you describe in Nausari in that, uh, in that book. And you speak of the influences of China, of this global trade, even in a small place like Nausari because of the Parsis who settled there and because of Parsi and also Jain culture. It was a very Jain place when I saw it. Um, would you like to say a little more perhaps about the Parsi and uh, maybe Baghdadi Jew investment in the opium trade? Um, the Baghdadi Jews' uh, in, uh, involvement in the opium trade uh, starts later, you know, I mean, because David Sassoon settles in Bombay in 1838, and it's not till really the 1880s that they become the dominant force uh, in the opium trade. But, uh, so, uh, the Parsis developed close uh, contacts with especially the Dutch, going back to the 17th century. And, uh, you know, all Western uh, and Central Indian commercial communities uh, were in one way or the other com uh, connected with the opium trade. Most of them had, uh, con were connected with the internal networks. So you have all these huge companies called uh, Khushal Singh, Hathi Singh, based in, uh, uh, based in Ahmedabad. You have other companies based in Karachi. Uh, so, you have a whole, I mean, every kind of, uh, including Maimans, Bohras, all of the, all the you know, commercial communities of Western India are connected with, uh, you know, opium. Uh, the difference between the Parsi role in it and the role of the others is that Parsis also traveled to China in person. Uh, this, the Indian communities on the whole did not. Uh, and I... One can only speculate, I think it's largely because, uh, you know, for one thing there was this ban, I mean there was some sort of caste uh, prohibition on uh, crossing the sea and so on. Uh, but, you know, later, around about the, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, more and more Sindhis and so on uh, started embarking on these journeys. Though the Rothschild of opium, the so-called Rothschild of opium, uh, was a Marwari Seth called uh, Seth Bahadur Mal, who was based in uh, Kota. And uh, in the 1830s, as early as the 1830s, he sent emissaries uh, 
uh, to Guangzhou to negotiate prices and so on. But the, uh, the problem really was that uh, the, the way in which trade was conducted in Guangzhou, there was a foreign enclave and in this foreign enclave, all foreign traders had to live in this foreign enclave and nowhere else. And only the men could go and it was a tiny little piece of land and there were like 13 factories there. And the factories were run by the East India Company had a large, large one, the Dutch East India Company uh, had a large one. Uh, they, there was no Indian factory, even though Indians were probably amongst the most uh, largest communities uh, in Guangzhou in that period. But when you were living in this factory, uh, you had to participate in the social life of the community, which involved uh, a lot of uh, feasts and drinking and eating. And my speculation is that for, let's say, uh, Indian mercantile communities, many of which were vegetarian, uh, this would have been difficult. It would have been difficult for Muslim mercantile communities because pork is so widely consumed, alcohol as well, and so on. So I think it was social usages uh, that kept them out. But uh, for the Parsis, it was incredible because, uh, you know, they developed uh, uh, an incredible exposure to the world of commerce of the 19th century. They learned what sorts of businesses were being built in America, in, uh, in Britain. And it's no coincidence at all that the Parsis of Bombay became the pioneers of every major Indian industry. Uh, you know, uh, so when Bombay's uh, opium exports started to decline in the late, because, uh, you know, various factors, but when it began to decline in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, Bombay was able to move seamlessly, you know, into a very modern, uh, I mean, even hotels. I mean, you yes. know, uh, this hotel chain is right. founded by Jamsejji Tata. And I think it's very clear that his inspiration for it came from what he saw in the hotels in Singapore, the hotels in Hong Kong, uh, you know. Yeah. Right. Uh, let me just um, ask about the incredible, uh, you know, visual component to your presentation. Uh, you, there was a narrative, but there were also these, in, you know, extraordinary um, images that you were showing. And I was reminded of uh, River of Smoke, which is a very painterly kind of novel. And uh, in River of Smoke, this uh, Zamindar Neil Ratan mentions that he has bought a picture of the 13 Hongs on f in flames. And it's a kind of vision because actually the fire took place much later, not when he bought the picture. The fire, you know, the setting fire to the opium, uh, the bales of opium, uh, happened much later. And uh, the whole visual representation uh, of the opium trade is also a very important element in the book, in the book that you write both in River of Smoke and in Smoke, uh, Smoke and Ashes. And do you think there is a reason for that? Do you think that there is an element uh, in the, uh, I mean, the way in which um, the opium trade and the trade with China, the chinoiserie, as it were, of the 19th century, influenced material culture taught us to look at the world in certain ways. And that's what you are repeatedly returning to, both in River, in River of Smoke and in Smoke and Ashes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's absolutely the case. Um, so, you know, for one thing, you know, this whole sort of uh, uh, enormous archive of images that exists of this trade. It's a fascinating one and you know, I could have gone on showing you images forever. <laughs> you know, they're so interesting. But I think this, can, you know, for me, what was the great sort of shock of learning about this history is that we tend to think of, uh, you know, this colonial period as India's economy becoming oriented towards Britain. In fact, what was the great intervention of this period is that India's economy, which had, uh, you know, till then, especially the trade and maritime economies, had been closely connected with uh, the Gulf, with Eastern Africa, with Indonesia, and so on, becomes completely oriented towards China, you know? So China becomes the fulcrum in the 19th century. 
And so there's a lot of coming and going between China, between India and China, and this had a profound influence. You know, for example, even the sari you're wearing, <laughs> you know, which we would recognize as a Banarasi sari, you know. But these saris were actually introduced by uh, Chinese, uh, by Chinese weavers. So, Sir so, so, so Jamshedji Jiji Boy bought these, uh, brought these Chinese brocade weavers uh, to Surat and they started producing these saris called Tan Choi saris, uh, which just means three, cha uh, three Tan, you know, because there were, uh, the Tan brothers uh, were there. So, uh, in the late, uh, early 20th century, the Tan Choi weaving began to decline in Surat and it moved to Banaras and uh, they became the Banarasi sari. You know, and in other ways as well, I mean, it's, uh, it's been suggested the Parsis were the first to, ad uh, to adopt the Chinese style blouse, which is what you're wearing. Uh, so, you know, it's profoundly uh, influenced so many aspects of Indian culture, of, you know, our visual landscape. I was just in Chennai yesterday and I was talking about a reverse glass painting. You know, those wonderful paintings that you see in Madurai and so on. Now, this was a technique that's introduced from uh, Central Europe uh, to China, and then through China, it's introduced to, uh, uh, again, uh, through Surat and Chennai, uh, it's introduced into India. So, you know, you have these circular patterns of exchange which create a very distinctive visual culture. Uh, so much so that, you know, I think uh, uh, we, when we tend to think of the sort of cultural transformations that happened in India in the 19th century, we tend to think of it as anglicization. Whereas I think it's actually something like that you could call cantonization, you know, because uh, that's what happens. I mean, it's in, it's not in, Sir uh, Jamshedji so Jiji went to England, you know, but he went to Guangzhou four times, which they called uh, Canton in those days. That's where he adopted all his, uh, all his, so to speak, cultural styles. You know, so when he, when he comes back to India in 18... So Guangzhou had these huge schools of art, you know, and they painted him over and again, you know. Actually, in the Jardine and Matheson headquarters uh, in Hong Kong, uh, you're not actually allowed to go to the top floor, but I had a friend there who took me up. Uh, there's a giant painting of Jam uh, Jamshedji Jiji Boy, you know, done in the, uh, done in the Canton style. So, uh, when, uh, in 1857, he does something completely radical. Uh, he donates this enormous sum of money, one lakh rupees in those days, uh, to found a school of art, which becomes the JJ uh, School of Art, which has had an incredible impact on the Indian visual landscape. You know, so even though the early principles of the JJ School of Art were Englishmen, I think this is a very clear instance of what you might call cantonization, you know. And that's true of furniture too, yes. isn't it? Furniture is a very, very important element in which this Chinese influence is visible, not only in India, of course, but also across the Western world. Um, I mean, look at the chair you're sitting yeah, on. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, I'd like to, um, because we can't take too long, but I'd like to ask you about one feature of the way that you have been writing from really uh, the great derangement onwards, uh, certainly in The Nutmeg's Curse and in The Living Mountain and in this book, In Smoke and Ashes, where uh, it appears as though you are speaking of plants and other living um, elements of our world, of our earth, as having agency. And uh, you speak therefore of the opium poppy as an agent in perpetuating itself and increasing its hold upon human uh, beings who will then propagate it more and more. Now, while um, this would require us to rethink the ways in which we talk about agency, because it's not simply, uh, you know, just saying that the opium poppy, like any animal, is also uh, 
an, an agent, a thinking and feeling agent, but also re, uh, re uh, calibrating how we understand the notion of agency itself. And secondly, it reminded me that when we were young, uh, uh, one great book that had an enormous influence on us, despite the fact that the author turned out to be not a very likable person, The Selfish Gene. Ah, uh, yes. You remember. Uh, so, I mean, would you say that um, planetary catastrophe has made us more aware of uh, a different order of agency extending to uh, the different um, elements that make up our world or Earth? Uh, yes, very much so. I mean, I think the planetary catastrophe has revealed to us really that, uh, you know, we are surrounded by beings of many kinds who have elements of sentience that we would not have recognized, you know. And certainly, every, I'm not, it's not just me, but many people who've written about uh, the history of opium. At a certain point, you do get this sense uh, that this thing, uh, the, uh, the opium poppy, this amazing flower, uh, is a thinking being. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's looking at us. <laughs> That's why I like the cover of this book, because, <laughs> you know, you can see the poppy looking at you. Uh, certainly, it's out-thought us at every point. Every attempt to, to, uh, to control or contain the opium poppy has failed. Uh, the opium poppy essentially defeated the world's most powerful army, the American army in Afghanistan. And as we can see today, uh, it is basically undermining structures of state uh, in India, in Mexico, in the United States, uh, and this story is far from over. I mean, uh, the opium poppy played a foundational role in the creation of modernity, and I think it's also going to play a very powerful role in the unmaking of modernity. Um, well, that's a very, uh, you know, sober thought, sobering thought to conclude on. But I would like to ask you for just a little more reflection on what is happening uh, in your book uh, towards the, in the last few chapters, you talk about um, America, you talk about the Americas, as it were, and you particularly talk about the opioid crisis in uh, the USA. But there is a similar crisis that confronts us in India today, particularly in two uh, states that are, in a sense, that have borders with other countries, uh, Punjab on the one hand, and if you think of the present crisis in Manipur, uh, there is also an element of drug um, smuggling that is you know, part of the reason why this crisis has been created. Punjab is a very, very sad story. So, um, is there something you'd like to say about, you know, how hopeful do you feel that we will be able to contain these forces that play havoc with our populations, that are, you know, that are much stronger than all kinds of state powers? And uh, it's not just a question of money. In a sense, they are what control capitalism. It's not capitalism that controls it, as it were. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's a very good point. I should explain here that, um, you know, uh, I've, been, I, I've been talking about opium in relation to India. Opium played just as important a role, if not more, in relation to American capitalism. I mean, especially in the early 19th century, many, many uh, Americans, from, especially from Boston and the Northeast, uh, they traded in opium and became in, immensely wealthy. Uh, the whole group known as Boston Brahmins were basically opium traders. Uh, and, uh, you know, so many of America's most important families and institutions are really founded on the opium trade. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, uh, his grandfather, Andrew Delano, was where all his money came from. And Andrew Delano was one of the biggest opium traders of the 19th century. Uh, this is true also of the Coolidge family, it's true of many other American families. And today you see a sort of complete reversal, you know, where, again, this is one of the reasons why I think uh, you, uh, 
in relation to opium, you have to think of some kind of intelligence at work. Because what happens is that opium creates these symmetries. You know, so the American opioid crisis of today is in many ways uncannily similar uh, to, the, uh, to, the Chinese, to the, what the Chinese were facing uh, in the 19th century. And as you say, opium has this kind of multiplier effect where, you know, it can insert itself into pre-existing fissures and tensions in society and greatly exacerbate them. And I think this is what we've seen in Manipur now, but it's not just Manipur. You know, in Manipur, every community is in some way involved in, uh, uh, in this trade. And uh, what opium does is that it makes very large amounts of money available. You know, and with those, uh, with those sums of money come guns and weapons. You know, so today, uh, I mean, I've, I've been read for following the Manipur crisis, uh, now we find out that there have actually been pitched battles. It's not like, um, not like the riots that we are accustomed to, pitched battles with, uh, you know, heavy weaponry going on uh, between communities there. And how this is going to be stopped or reversed, I don't know. You know, similarly, you know, a lot of the weapons that were intended for Ukraine have now ended up in the hands of Mexican drug, drug cartels. Mexican drug, I mean, the, America's deployed this incredibly militarized force against the me me Mexican drug cartels. And the Mexican cartels have been able to uh, hold their own, you know, if not more. So, you know, we are really seeing, uh, as it were, the unraveling of uh, many kind of structures of governance that we've uh, relied upon in the past, and this is only going to accelerate. Yes, uh, well, that is true, but on the other hand, you also point out in your book that this is the product of only the past 200 or 300 years, that prior to that, it isn't as though opium was unknown. It was known to human populations from antiquity. And it had been used in a recreational way on the side of other drugs and other opiates and so on for a very long period, centuries. And this kind of large-scale cultivation had never really taken place, nor large-scale trading in it. So it is over the last 200 years, 200, 300 years, that we have set about destroying ourselves just as we have set about destroying the planet. Exactly. Exactly. That's very well put. So uh, perhaps we can take some questions. But before that, can... maybe we could make the announcement about uh, Mohaparbut. Yes, uh, perhaps uh, is there an official... After? An... After the questions? After, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes, well, if you uh, agree, we could take a few questions from the audience. Sure. After that, we have a further announcement, another book to be launched. Yes. Um, do you think that whoever wants to ask a question should come up and ask it from here because we can't see anything? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not particularly photogenic. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, I have to stand? Okay, like, it's like a school. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, I uh, have a question about an article that you wrote at one time where you mentioned the late, great Shunil Gangopadhyay mentioned to you that you are a Bengali writer who writes in English. Um, as in, I assume, not just ethnically, but also in the tradition of Bengali writership. Uh, your novels are very Indian, and I see, I have it written, so it will be fairly articulate. And uh, geographically, many of your novels are part set in the subcontinent and South Asia, Burma, China, as is this as well. So your themes are universal, and your characters hop out of the large Western cities, London, New York, as they do in Shadow Lines. Calcutta chromosome. So my question essentially is, how do you place yourself geographically as a writer? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because, you know, uh, I've uh, traveled a lot, I've lived in many different places, and I've lived in uh, America for a long time. But uh, 
You know, I think of myself, in a sense, on the analogy of a compass. That is, one end of the compass is fixed in, uh, uh, in, in Kolkata, really, and the other, the other part, the other arm, sort of roams about quite freely. Certainly, this story is not a story that you can tell uh, as a national story or even as a regional or continental story. It's a completely global story. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we don't know so much about it, because it's, it's a very difficult story to tell simply because, uh, you know, it ties the whole world together, uh, you know, at a very early, uh, early point in the uh, 18th century onwards. So I would say that it's because I've, I've been in movement for a long time that uh, I can even undertake such a, such a task. Okay, uh, Dr. Ghosh, I just wanted uh, some elaboration on the investment scenario in early 19th century America, was opium a major source of that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so what would happen uh, is that, you know, these young, uh, uh, there were two or three companies basically based in, uh, in Boston. You know, uh, well, to take a step back, uh, America becomes independent in 1783, but in that period, uh, because of its independence, it can't really trade with all the British colonies around it. And it's surrounded by British colonies, Canada, the Caribbean, and so on. It's also shut out of the European trade. At this point, its only possible trading partner is China. And the Americans understand this very early, and their economy, even at that point, becomes very oriented towards China. For example, the Lewis and Clark expeditions are launched, uh, you know, which go across America, are launched with the idea of opening new routes to China. So this China trade really becomes absolutely formative of early America. So the, uh, the traders like John Jacob Astor of the, you know, Waldorf Astor, Astoria, et cetera, all of them become very heavily involved in trading with China. They face the same problem though that the British faced, which is that they don't have any product that the Chinese want. So, like the British, they begin developing uh, uh, a new opium trade. They start uh, sourcing opium from Turkey. But Turkish opium was never uh, very big in quantity. So, they eventually gravitated also towards Indian opium. They became very important in Bombay. Uh, you know, they created all these connections with, uh, I mean, you know, by the 1790s, there are uh, literally settlements of Americans trading in uh, Malwa opium and so on. Uh, so, you know, the firms that are set up in this period, uh, for example, Forbes, you know, of, the, <laughs> of the, uh, an iconic name in uh, American capitalism, they, got their, they get their start in opium. So these young uh, Bostonians, they go out to China uh, and they keep traveling to India to buy opium here, then they take it to China, sell it there, and within uh, like two or three years, they make these unbelievable fortunes. You know, uh, hundreds of thousands, of, you know, which today would be like hundreds of millions of dollars. Then they go back home, and these are, they're still young men, you know, they're in their uh, 20s and so on, and they go back with, like Parsi traders, with this very expanded knowledge of the world, with a very expanded knowledge of international trade, and they start investing heavily in the early American economy. And actually, many Chinese merchants invest through them. So, for example, the, uh, the early railroads in America are all financed by opium money. You know, so that's why, if you look at, you know, the name Canton uh, is very common in America, Canton, Ohio, and so on, you know. And that's one of the reasons. If you look at the, uh, if you look at where these cantons are located, they're almost always uh, near uh, railroad junctions. You know, so I mean, they're actually acknowledging that uh, that debt, uh, if you like, uh, to China in this period. So yes, I mean, um, uh, if you look at the uh, at the depth of what the ways in which opium money transformed uh, uh, America. Well, that, I have several chapters in my book about this. So, you know, I think you might find that interesting. <laughs>
speaking as a huge fan, of course, of your writing and here only because of that. I was wondering, because you've accessed a lot of archives, uh, for particularly for this book and a lot of British archives, did you find it easy to access Chinese archives and were they open to talk to you about the whole opium business? Because it's such an under the radar subject, opium, even now, nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, that's absolutely true. Um, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't read Chinese, so it, was, it wasn't possible for me to work with Chinese archives. But fortunately, you know, a lot of material has been translated. And in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a whole spate of research on, uh, uh, you know, opium production in India, opium consumption in China, a huge spate of research. And some of it has actually been inspired uh, by, by the IBIS trilogy. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, now there's so much more research than existed when I started writing the IBIS trilogy. So, you know, there's, a, there's more material almost than one can, uh, than one can process. Uh, just one more question, please, and you can... Shup Shupriya, the, you yeah. choose at uh, random who you want. <laughs> Maybe a woman. I see a young woman over at the back uh, over there. I can't... Uh, yeah, somebody at the back? Ah, uh, there. There yes. she is. Yeah, there she is. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Sir, um, it is, uh, as you've mentioned, that Ashes and Smoke takes readers uh, behind your research and methodology. And uh, th all throughout your writings, we have seen such details and meticulous details all throughout your writings. So uh, my question is, taking a departure from your writing style or what, what have been presented, uh, my question is, uh, do you f make, does these research make you an avid traveler? Because uh, all the books, they sort of take a journey through, right from the first page to the last sentence. Uh, if we talk about Hungry Tide, the last scene of the whole storm and all. So does these research or your uh, findings make you an avid traveler? And if so, do you personally feel that such research back you up when you go on your uh, travels or when you yourself take any personal travels uh, on these, uh, on these paths? Thank you. Uh, yes, travel is absolutely fundamental to my way of working. I mean, uh, to my way of thinking, I go to places, I learn about them and, uh, you know, it stimulates me in so many different ways. So I think, in a sense, you could say this is also Calcutta legacy because Kundu travels, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Uh, hello, Amitabh sir. Hello, uh, Shupriya ma'am. So uh, the room is actually buzzing with facts and fiction today, tonight. So I actually wanted to know a few things. Um, since uh, you travel a lot and you, tra you have to travel because you gather facts, so has it ever occurred uh, to you that you had to stay in a particular place to write a fiction or, you know, non-fiction? And if it is possible, it's a please humble request to hear a few words in Bengali. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> to say a few words in Bengali. Look, when I was writing a book in Hungry Tide, I was writing a book in Hungry Tide, and I was writing a book <laughs> so, so last question, if I might. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, uh, <laughs> you know, you you mentioned more than once about the incarceration of the ethnic Chinese in India, and that it's a blot on uh, modern India. Uh, it a similar thing also happened during the Second World War to the Japanese in the U.S. But do you think the ethnic Chinese that came to India? Did the opium trade have something to do with it? Was it, you know, it was of course, as we know, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, fight with the communists and all of that. But, but the, did the Indian presence, was there an Indian presence because of the opium trade, a factor that led to so many Chinese migrating to India? Um, trade with China certainly was very important in this. Because as we know, uh, you know, the earliest uh, Chinese settlements uh, were uh, around Calcutta in the 1780s. And then, you know, lots of others came. Because the trade was happening, a lot of sailors uh, jumped ship, settled here. So it's a very old, uh, it's a very old settlement. And uh, actually, the f in the very first chapter in my book, I talk about 
I talk about uh, what happened to the Chinese community. I think for Calcutta as a city, uh, that was an, in I mean, it was a tragedy, of course, for what happened for the Chinese who went through this. But it was a tragedy for Calcutta, most of all. Because, you know, this is the period in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, when the Chinese diaspora are basically creating, uh, uh, you know, the economic transformation of Southeast Asia. And they could have done that here too, if they'd been, uh, if they had not been molested in, uh, in this way. So I think that's one of the great missed opportunities, really, for the city and for the country. Thank you. Um, I think that we, we have to make yeah, the announcement. I think that we have to stop here. Um, thanks for that answer, because I do think the book begins with China, it begins with tea, and then it moves on to opium, and then it ends again with China. And I do think that this uh, sense of a relationship that should have brought us, you know, great, uh, bene that would have meant great benefits to uh, very large human populations uh, has not uh, happened in the way that it should have happened. That's also a sub-theme of this book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Shupriyadi. Thank you, Amitabh. Uh, we started with a book launch and uh, we're going to conclude with a book launch. Uh, Udayan had mentioned that a small book came out just before uh, uh, Smoke and Ashes, The Living Mountain, and we're delighted to present Anundo Publishers' Bangla translation of the book, Pran Porbot, and the translation is by uh, Professor Shukantu Choudhury, and I'd like to uh, invite him onto stage so that we can have a small ceremonial unveiling of the book. So please put your hands together for this. It was a beautiful book, The Living Mountain, and I can only recommend it in both languages. It is a thought-provoking parable on the world we live in today. <laughs>